Welcome to Investor in the Family Radio, a podcast dedicated to helping you make better investments in less time so you can live more life. My name is Brian Bain and I'm your host. You can find more shows and other valuable content at InvestorInTheFamily.com. Well, on today's show, we have a special guest, Bram de Haas from the Netherlands, and so excited to have him with us today. And recently, Bram wrote an article for Seeking Alpha entitled, Netflix Overvalued or Disney Undervalued? So really getting at the idea of valuations for both Netflix and Disney, which ones are right, and in, in the end, where's the best place for investors to put their money? So Bram, thanks for joining us. Hi, Brian. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, hey, thanks for your great article, for sharing that content with us on Seeking Alpha, and for the joining us in the interview here today. Uh, well, uh, thank you. I'm glad that you liked it, and um, yeah, happy to be here. Well, to get us started, and you know, all everyone listening to this, some of them may have read the article, but many of them probably have not yet. Do you mind giving us some background in terms of the article itself and kind of what maybe some of your main points or themes were? Sure. Well, I think the main point is actually very simple. Uh, Netflix and Disney are uh, about the same uh, market cap uh, right now. And at some level, it's quite strange because um, uh, Disney has got a a much longer history and it's been uh, producing award-winning content for uh, a lot longer time. And what's why that's so strange is because you you could say Netflix is valued like a platform company, but it is not behaving like a, like the best of the platform companies because it is actually investing a lot of a lot of dollars into content just like Disney is, and they're you know they're spending about the same amount, and that suggests that Netflix is is aware that its platform or network effect is not that strong and it needs to invest in content. It can't rely on others' content. And if that's the case, and they're spending the same amount on content, then they can be valued the same because Disney has a a lot larger library of content already in existence. And that's about, well, the basic of my article. Fascinating. Okay, so tell me, you mentioned that Netflix is being valued like a platform company, but they're not acting like one instead because they're investing so heavily in content creation. Can you elaborate on what you mean by they're, um, they're being valued like a platform company? Sure. Well, they're, you know, they're growing very rapidly and um, people are looking at their su- subscribers as like the, um, the most uh, foremost important metric. And in some ways, it is like a platform company, like a Facebook or an Airbnb, because you know if you add subscribers on one side and you have content providers on the other side, they they both uh, inc- make the platform increasingly attractive to each other. It's just the standard network effect. Yeah, and it's not. There's are differences strength of these platforms. Like a Facebook is is super strong. Like the Google Plus was it total failure uh, because you don't need a second Facebook. But there, there can be absolutely other content platforms like Hulu, like Amazon. So in that in that sense, it's a much weaker kind of platform. Yeah, because I guess with a platform company, like you gave the examples of Facebook and Airbnb, you know, there's, a, like you said, a, a network effect there. But with Netflix, you know, there's not there's no not really any network effect. Like I don't really benefit significantly unless I'm missing something from you know if there's one million people on Netflix or a hundred million, it doesn't really change the experience for me. Except maybe Netflix can then afford better content, maybe. But that's yeah, exactly. that's not and really a significant data on what everybody likes, and um, uh, they can adjust shows based on that. And but it's you're you're right. It's not it's totally not as strong as an eBay or something like that. Yeah, well, with, um, again, Facebook, the network effect, then I have that many more people I can personally connect with and that many, much more content I can interact with. Amazon, there's that many more reviews that I can get feedback on to see the quality of products and that many more merchants selling products like on eBay, as you mentioned. And that, so the, the network effect in those platforms seems very clear, but you make a good point. Um, yeah, there's some yeah. of it in the in the data that the bulls on Netflix uh, claim there's a lot to the the data effect on Netflix that you you can collect so much um, data on the uh, preferences of users that it helps you to uh, laser um, yeah 
laser focused content and and that keeps subscribers engaged and uh, attached to the service well i guess maybe maybe where the intersection happens because you mentioned if they're we'll get to the competing with disney component in a moment but if they are being valued like a platform company and investors and analysts are looking heavily at the number of subscribers well, which makes sense because that's where the revenue comes from um, but as far as them spending money on content, I guess, I mean, I guess those, I guess the, where those two things go hand in hand are, and are significant is because their best bet for future subscribers is unique, valuable content, right? Well, yeah, yeah. I think it's actually a great way to for them to spend their money. I think that's an excellent. It's actually an excellent business model, and maybe this this data even makes them um, uh, spend money very efficiently and, and uh, like achieve great uh, IRRs or uh, return on investments. Uh, but it's just the valuation is so far, far so high that there, there could be a really good outcome for like the, the original investors. I'm sure Reed Hastings will end up happy with the outcome <laughs> 10 years from now. <laughs> It's not, I'm not sure if you're happy if you buy in now. Okay, let's talk about that. Can you, and again, I'm coming at this from the, from the perspective of an investor who does not have a lot of background investment knowledge in Netflix or Disney. So I want to ask my questions from that standpoint to help, kind of help fill in gaps for everyone listening. Talk to me about the Netflix valuation. What, like, where, what is the valuation approximately and how does it relate to peers or if, I mean, I know there aren't direct peers, but what, what makes it seem so high? Yeah, it's it's the fact that you're paying the, the exact same, it's exactly the same um, uh, f- value as, as Disney. So they're worth the same. You can buy either company for the same amount of dollars. And But at Disney, you get the entire Star Wars library, you get the Marvel library, you get all the, the, the entire Pixar. Disney library. Our library, yeah, sure. You've got the theme parks. Um, the, the, they've got ESPN. It's it's crazy. The all the assets they've got. The, uh, there's a Wikipedia on all the assets of Disney, and it's 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 so long. <laughs> right. I can I even put it in the article because it would just overwhelm everything. And it, of yeah. course, the big ones are where the most of the value is, but it still it gives you an idea of what builds up and sometimes you can go back to really old content and really reinvigorate it that's ex- exactly what happened with star wars or so, so this the old content can be really valuable it's still in the minds of uh you know uh, older people <laughs> well i mean i mean for me like star wars was an integral part of my childhood mm-hmm. i mean and for the rest of my life whether i like the new movies or not those original three movies are just defining aspects in terms of my cultural experience growing up as a kid and those characters and everything else. And so you're right in terms of, you know, if, if those movies come, if someone wanted to watch those movies again right now, I would be happy to do it. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. And, and if there's a new one coming out, you know, like uh, what happens with Jurassic Park, even, yeah. People is Jurassic go, Park Disney as well? No, I, I don't think think so. But it's yeah, it's right. just a recent example of you know something old that gets um, oh, reinvigorated, right. and then you think oh, for good old times' sake, you're going to watch it, even though you, it may not be actually really your cup of tea, or uh, you still go watch it. And then after a while, you know, now Star Wars is getting a little bit, it's get overdone. So there's too too many spinoffs, too much sequels, and then people are tired of it for a while, like in Lord of the Rings and. They wait a while, and in ten years, they go back to it again. Well, so here's here's a question too, though. Obviously, Netflix, generally speaking, is a much more simple company. They have subscribers, and they either license or create content and sell it to the subscribers on a monthly basis. But Disney, on the other hand, you know, is a massive conglomeration of all kinds of different things in terms of television assets, content assets with movies. Um, theme parks and probably a lot of other things that I'm that I'm leaving off the table. Is it possible that the complexity of Disney is part of the problem? There's a lot of aspects there that are dragging down the valuation. Maybe. Oh, sh- oh, oh, sure. It doesn't have to be all on uh, Netflix overvalued. This discrepancy. 
it, there could be something to Disney being undervalued. And actually, yeah, I, I'm leaning towards thinking like that. There's that Netflix may be a little bit overvalued, well, and Disney a little bit undervalued. Um, and complexity is something that tends to really depress things. And I think we're seeing that right now, like across the market. Um, lots of more complex companies are getting discounted a little bit. Yeah, I mean, reading some of the comments in the article, that was a few things. I think one of the things someone mentioned was the complexity component. And then obviously there's, like people mentioned what you just said, you know, it's crazy that Disney is valued around the same as Netflix when they have unbelievable trophy assets, as you said a while ago, which is true. And I mean, they, it's, they have sure, I mean, brands. Even, like, yeah. I mean, if you look at um, some of the best of the best movies that have been released in the last, you know, in recent years, there, I mean, uh, probably at least a good majority of them are going to be tied to Disney. Yeah, I think that's about right. Like uh, 50% or something, that, yeah. that could be right. I mean, all uh, the Marvel uh, movies, the Pixar movies, the Star Wars movies alone is is pretty incredible. Yeah, and uh, I mean, bears usually argue that um, superhero Marvel thing is, is running a little bit out of steam. Uh, could be, maybe not, I'm not sure. Sure. Uh, but something like Hulu, like... Disney owns 30% of it. They're now trying to buy assets from Fox. If they close that deal, which is not uh, it's not a done deal because I think Comcast is coming in, they get another 30% of uh, Hulu. And that's, that's actually a pretty big service that's very similar to, um, to Netflix. I think sure. it's like one-fifth the size, but it's growing faster. Uh, so, I mean, it's not nothing. And it's just thrown in there. Huh. Yeah, well, again, that's that complexity component. And that's why I wonder, you know, is if you take the content ownership aspect of Disney and then and you separate that out and then look at all the other components, you know, theme parks, et cetera, I wonder, you know, because obviously a theme park and things like that are there's a lot of capital required to maintain those, to upgrade those and, and things like that. And again, I'm speaking out a little bit of ignorance. So people in the comment section, if you want to fill in some gaps for us, that's great. But if I wonder if somehow that is part is if there's a drag there that's causing part of the problem, because because otherwise, if you just if there's no drag coming from those extra assets and you just siphon those off and do kind of what you're saying, let's just look purely at the content owned by Disney and the content owned by Netflix and I mean, you compare the two, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to knock any of the content that Netflix has created, but to compare that to, you know, the epic brands that Disney have, I think is probably a little bit naive. I mean, you know, maybe you could say Netflix, their brands and content's newer and hasn't had the time to have that impact. It's like, well, no, because most of the people in the country don't have Netflix accounts, so they're never going to see that content anyway. So I think you can't make that argument. I wonder if part of it is the subscription aspect, because I know that. You know, I've had discussions recently with people talking about Apple, for example, and Microsoft. You know, one of the big turnarounds in the stock price for Microsoft has coincided with their shift to much more of a, a subscription model in terms of the, the different services they offer. And recently, you've seen Apple doing more of the same with more, you know, they, have, they have a lot more Apple services components, whether it be cloud and otherwise that is recurring subscription and the investors I've spoken to just talk about how much Wall Street likes that because it's predictable. And whereas with Disney, you know, most of these content brands are discussing are um, like big movies, big one off. Like maybe you have Avengers Infinity War come out and make over a billion dollars really quick, but then you've got to wait for the next big movie and you never know if it's going to be a hit or a flop. Like my understanding is the newer Star Wars movie isn't doing super great. Versus Netflix, you know, every single month people are paying their whatever it is, 12 bucks. And when that grows, there's just incredible consistency and reliability to that. I wonder how much that factors in. And I'll say one more thing to add into that. And then ESPN, probably the number one subscription service Disney has, is struggling and has declining numbers. I wonder if those two components is a huge part of what we're seeing. Well, I think you're, you're really... Uh onto something big. I think that's a, a big reason. Um, Wall Street and it, as investors, we all like, um, you know, um, stable cash flow. So subscriptions, that's great. They get higher multiples. I think that's 
we we've seen that in research uh, that proves that out. Um, to your other uh, point, yeah, people really hate um, the hit and miss from the content. Like uh, I used to have uh, own DreamWorks, and people hated the unpredictability of having a hit show or having another movie that you know you just get your costs back. And and it's just the same with um, Lionsgate. It, it, those are not valued that highly. Um, so so there's really something to that argument. Um, on the other, but the um, once you, the theme parks and the licensing business and the merchandising that's all built on the hit shows. You kind of invest in the content, which is not super great business. Like you like you said, is hit and miss. But once you hit something and you don't know what what is going to be, every time you think you're making something something great, but people aren't buying into it or they nah they think nah that's not so good. But then you're, you've got a hit, and then you built the franchise around it. It's those things. I don't. They're not planned. They're just tr- they're throwing spaghetti against the wall. And um, at some point, you've got a Star Wars. Well, and and I guess that references a point made earlier. That, but the thing about Disney is, yes, there's a hit and miss component with movies. But when you have the branding they have, like Pixar, for example, man, you can line up the entire Pixar library and. You know, I challenge you to find anything you consider to be a miss. You know, maybe some weren't as big as others, but I don't know they've had any release that hasn't at least done really well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it could be true. Uh, I've, I've done a lot of research into DreamWorks because I've owned it for a long time. It was very similar. But the problem with it was that those animation movies, they're always expensive to make. You can't make an inexpensive one. There were, I think, like, uh, at least 80 to 120 million uh, a piece. So, you know, some barely, you're, you're still making an okay movie if you make something like that. But uh, sure. yeah, it's a, there are huge investments with, with um, you know, if it's just the regular uh, kinds, th- those can be cheaper. I mean, the big budget ones are more expensive, but you can make them cheaper. So tell me this, do you feel like you can make a stronger argument that, and I know you, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I want to go back to it a little bit. Do you think you can make a stronger argument that Netflix is overvalued or a stronger argument that Disney is undervalued? I think the argument that Disney is undervalued is more useful to people. I mean, there are not that many people who would short something like Netflix. It can also fly you know, straight in your face. Um, so, and I think there's some truth to that, but, but, but it's not, so, I actually really like, uh, the company Netflix and their service. And I think it's great what they're, what they're doing. And uh, maybe a little bit of a strange, uh, thing, but what actually is pretty interesting is they're, uh, they've, they've got bonds out and, um, th- those may be, uh, the most interesting for Netflix. Yeah, okay. perhaps because they, what makes they've you say got, that? Yeah. Well, they're like, um, uh, people figure they're like junk bonds. So they've got, uh, I think they're like with a 5% yield or something. But you've got this huge equity cushion. There's like 20 times as much equity as there's debt. So, you know, before the debt will be impaired, the equity will need to disappear. So if you think that can never happen, well, maybe, you know, 5%, that's not so bad. I mean, people are not expecting, a lot of professional investors are not expecting the market to return 5%. So that may be a little bit unusual, but I don't hate everything about Netflix. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, tell me this. Um, and if you don't have it in front of you, that's fine. But are is are Netflix bonds trading below par or over par? Like, is there a potential for an, a capital yeah. appreciation there as well? So now I just looked at, uh, the, I think, the ones that run, run until uh, 2025. I think they were trading a little bit above par. So, so that took the yield to like 5%. Gotcha. Yeah. And I think they just recently issued uh, uh, another, um, another set. But I don't like the longer maturities that much. So. Sure. No, yeah, I don't. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, I was thinking if they yeah, that would be pretty, I mean, if, they, if those happen to be under par, and paying 5%, that could be a pretty compelling opportunity. Um, sure. yeah, and it's fun talking about bonds because I feel like 
I mean, I, I talk to a lot of investors and typically the conversations are almost always equity related because I think it's easier for people to understand or at least feel like we understand equities better. And bonds seem a little more complex to think than most people. But man, like it, the more I've learned about bond opportunities, I mean, individual bonds, not like ETFs for bonds and things like that. There are, it's, it's pretty amazing that, I mean, there are some incredible opportunities in bonds, <laughs> not that change the conversation. And that may seem like an ignorant comment, but I just don't hear many people discussing it, but there are some really great opportunities for people who really understand those markets. Yeah, I think so. But I, I, uh, I don't think it's that much harder. It's actually easier. You know, you, you know, you can figure out the yields in how many years you'll get your money back. And um, some of those equities, it's so debatable. You, we've gone back and forth like half an hour about Disney and Netflix, which is undervalued, which is overvalued. You can, you can, uh, bear, bears can bring arguments, bulls can bring arguments. Sometimes, yeah, bonds can be refreshingly. Is that, is that yield? And it's, I'm going to get it. So, right. <laughs> it's nice. Um, yeah. Maybe that's the problem. It's too boring for people. It's like, well, I know exactly what I'm going to make on this, and I, there's nothing for me to talk about. I don't know who knows, but anyway, I think there's something to that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me. Let me. Okay. This. Let me th- think back because pulling back the, the Netflix and Disney. So it sounds like, I guess, part of the component with Netflix too is, you know, you mentioned that platform component. It is. It's, I mean, I don't want to call it a new company, but it it is much more of a Silicon Valley tech company which I'm sure that brings a lot of the um, high optimism. And it's been it's, it's seeing high tangible growth. And I'm sure those factor in significantly in terms of, you know, a more optimistic valuation. It doesn't make it wrong per se, but, you know, it's a lot easier to look at a Disney and think of that as a um, much more of a stagnant company with that's already large and hard to grow. But Netflix appears to be like one that's got a lot of more, more momentum potentially. Yeah, and I think, you know, people are excited about those because some of them, they are absolutely great and it will stay great. But I, I think Netflix is not one of those that when it gets a head start and it runs out, that you, you can't catch. Like Facebook is one of those or Airbnb. I think like Uber is weaker than Airbnb because it's so per city. But um, yeah, some of, the, some of those, you, you can catch them and then they deserve really high valuations. But uh, if Disney is pulling content back from Netflix, they're launching uh, a Disney over-the-top service. Uh, they're maybe getting 60% of Hulu. Uh, YouTube Premium is, uh, you know, just got rebranded. I think they've got a nice uh, uh, hit show now. Uh, there's Twitch, which is a little bit different, but there's that. Uh, there's so many over-the-top players coming, uh, getting into that space. And, uh, yeah, you Getting a head start with low subscription rates and getting subscribers, it's not maybe not enough to protect you. Well, you know, and that's actually been one of my um, reservations with Netflix all along has been the fact that, and again, I may easily be proven wrong, and it appears that so far I have been, that historically, you know, they've, they've really relied upon outside content. And then I've always thought, well, that's problematic because how how hard would it, I mean, obviously there's, there's struggle with that, but you know, for someone who owns con- a lot of content like a Sony or a Disney, they can start their own subscription service, and it, you know, they they've with that brand power, I'm sure they could they could build it pretty meaningfully, um, and they could develop the same network effect that a Netflix has, and really rob a lot of the value from Netflix. Which obviously, I think that that whole argument is the entire reason why Netflix has started creating their own content because they know that otherwise they're completely dependent upon outside providers, which then brings us back to the exact same conversation of like, well, who has the best content? And it's <laughs> hard to say um, from a branding perspective, you know, Netflix has done very well with their, their TV series um, content. But from an epic brand perspective, it's really hard to argue with the trophy assets that Disney has sitting on their balance sheet or on their vault sure, or whatever you want to call it. And also uh, to, to tie into that, a little bit there were recently i um i think it was an article and it was with one of the or maybe an earnings call with one of the top people of uh, netflix and he basically said um that okay they identified like maybe 10 people who were like top producers they could like do the tier one type of content but if that's if that's only 10 people i mean 
dealers are going to identify those even just because they are on the on the show um you know the the, the real at the end so, so it, people are going to compete for them and then it doesn't matter that you have extra data because you find them first but then they bit offer them more money sure yeah i mean it's essentially they're they're lone rangers they can go to the highest bidder which tip is what happens i mean in almost whether it be sports or um i mean how many times you see a director you know produce um content for one studio then another studio and actors and actresses go they they float freely they don't have ties to studios um yeah so, you can yeah. Very hard to uh you know if you really you know companies always say that they are you know based on their people that they're their most expensive uh, or most important asset but if it's true that you almost never have a great business okay one last quote before we wrap up here in just a minute um again if i'm wrong just correct me but my understanding is that one big benefit with netflix is don't they produce like a tremendous amount of free cash flow oh no they don't no. Uh, do they not? So, uh, well, is it, well, i guess they produce it but then they reinvest it all or it, yeah, they, I mean they've got a quite you know they've got good revenue from all the subscribers, but they yeah they plow it into creating new content. Right. Well, so so if you looked at like an like an Amazon for example, Amazon has incredible revenues, but you know they they never have meaningful profits because they're reinvesting it. But if they decided, hey, I'm going to stop reinvesting for a little while, then you know <laughs> you, you know back yeah, no, you know, you got all this cash flowing in, and, and my understanding is that Netflix. I mean, technically has that same potential, but they just choose to continue to reinvest it all. Is that accurate? Yeah, that could be like a, a good strategy. So I'm not necessarily criticizing Netflix for being, a, a, you know, not having a good strategy or not playing their cards right. It's just people may be overpaying a little bit for, for this execution, even if it's excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and I was just wondering if maybe that's part of the factor, maybe that they at least have the ability to create and have a lot more free cash flow, whereas Disney, maybe they may be tied up in a lot more um, capital costs that don't allow them that same flexibility. And again, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I may be wrong, and people in the comments would love to hear you jump in if you have more data on that. Um, but that's one other thing I was thinking maybe is part of part of it. But either way, yeah. Disney ahead. can can you know spend the same amount as Netflix on creating content every year, and it's got a lot of like 10 billion of cash flow left over after that. So it could also, you know, really outspend them. So you're really thinking like how, how much better ROI can uh, Netflix generate on its content? I don't think the gap is like massive. Maybe they can do a little bit better, but it gets harder as they grow. If you're, if you're there now investing something like uh, over 6 billion per year in content, if you, it's very hard to find to make great deals to like find the undervalued actors or or um, you know the the shows that others didn't pick up because you you just need to keep buying new new shows. Excellent point. Hey, Brom, thanks so much for joining us. I know it's it's late for you and so <laughs> with a time difference, but thanks so much for your ongoing contribution at Seeking Alpha, and thanks for joining us on the interview today. Well, uh, th thanks for having me on on your show. It was a pleasure. The information and opinions contained on this podcast are for educational purposes only. The information does not consider the economic status or risk profile of any specific person. The information and opinions expressed should not be construed as investment trading advice and does not constitute an offer or an invitation to make an offer to buy and sell securities.